Hello, Becky Edwards here, Purpose Driven Mentoring. I want to share my top 15 favorite takeaways or life lessons from the story of Peter walking on water in the New Testament. I love this story. It's found in Matthew chapter 14. And man, I could go on and on and on about all the life lessons in it. In fact, a couple days ago, I posted on my own Facebook page, hey, what are your life lessons you pull from this story? And I got, I don't know, maybe 90 responses. It was really fun to read through those and hear these different um, takeaways and messages. So I want to share uh, some of my own and combined with some that I, that I pulled from these wonderful friends of mine. And so you might hear your, your sharing along in, in here. And I, I apologize, I didn't uh, take specific notes of who said what, but a lot of uh, just some great ideas. So here are my top 15 favorites. The first one is when Christ says um, to Peter, so, so let's review the story a little bit. So Peter is in a boat with the other apostles and it's night and there's it's stormy and they're getting nervous and then Christ walks on water to them and first they think it's a ghost and they're kind of nervous and and then and Christ's like, no, it's me, don't be scared, it's okay. And, and Peter says, Christ, if it's really you, tell me to walk on the, come to you on the water and I'll come. And Peter, Christ says one word, come. And Peter scrambles up over the edge of the boat and starts to walk. And as soon and as, as he's looking at Christ, he's walking. But as, as soon as he looks to the side at the scariness of the waves and the wind, he starts to sink. And he, then he calls Christ's name. Christ rescues him, brings him back to the boat, and the story. And well, this, and then they testify, "Wow, you really are the Christ." <laughs> so that's the story. Life, life lesson number one is when Peter uh, sinks and Christ says to him, Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? I personally take that, and I'm going to show this for my friend, Jim, my friend Jamie, and I totally love this. Take it to say not, Oh, I've criticized your little bit of faith. He's basically saying, Look what you were able to do. You can even do better. Look, when you kept your faith focused on me, you walked on water. And then did you notice when you started to sink was when you took your focus off of me and started looking at your doubts and fears. So notice that. And the next time you can do better. It reminds me of President Hinckley. He's oh, he was so great at saying, you guys are doing awesome and you can do a little better. And so that is what I, my takeaway number one is you're doing awesome and you can do a little better. Um, so number two takeaway is we are like toddlers learning how to walk. I, I've taught this so many times, so you maybe have heard me teach this before, but the idea being when you have a, a little one-year-old, little 10-month-old, however old they are, learning how to walk, we as parents understand there are falls. There are, there's a lot of practicing. There's a lot of experimenting. There's a lot of falls and getting back up. That's all part of the process of walking, right? We get that. And so we're not impatient with the process. We just encourage them and we don't criticize them and bully them and shame them. If we're good parents, we don't, right? We just like, yay, you did it. Good job. Get up. Let's do it again. Yay. You know, we're just thrilled at their trying. We're thrilled at it. And Heavenly Father has made us into the same kind of people ourselves. We are line upon line learners. That is how he's made us. He did not make us to be, let's go from being a baby to an adult all in one day. Like, no, that'd be super painful and terrible. <laughs> we are line upon line learners, whether it's physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, like we learn by repetition, by practicing, by falling, by getting up. And it's part of the plan and it's okay. That's really comforting, don't you think? Um, number three, teeter-totter. This is a takeaway called, I, that I call the teeter-totter. So let me grab a book here. So if, if I have uh, faith on one side of the teeter-totter and doubt and fear on the other side, faith, doubt, and fear, faith, doubt, and fear, who decides where, which one wins in my, inside me, my brain, my mind, and my heart? Only I decide. Nobody else can decide for me. I'm the only one who can decide to put more emphasis and focus on faith, so faith wins. Now, if I choose, just like Peter did, to move over into doubt and fear by focusing on that, then those start to win, which is what happened when he sank, right? Again, not criticizing Peter. Peter's awesome. <laughs> but it was a great lesson for all of us, right? And 
uh, I, boy, you've probably had similar experiences where you have learned that I really get to choose which one I feed. Do I feed faith or do I feed fear and doubt? And that teeter-totter moves accordingly. So, I, man, I could share many stories, but that's it for, that's good for today. Number four, takeaway, we miss blessings simply by not asking. Now, there were all these apostles in the boat. One asked for a, for a blessing, of this particular blessing, by saying, Christ, if it's you, or Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come on the water and I'll do it. He asked, and Christ said, come. And Peter was the only one who, who jumped overboard and started to walk. How many times, how many blessings are we missing simply because we do not ask? I want to share one of my favorite parts of the Bible dictionary. It's in the section on prayer. The object of prayer is not to change the will of God, but to secure for ourselves and for others blessings that God is already willing to grant us, but that are made conditional upon on our asking for them. Did you hear that? There are blessings God is willing and ready to give us if we will simply ask. Whoa. And there are certain blessings we've only received because we asked. That's pretty powerful. And then, and then it says blessings require some work or effort on our part before we can obtain them. Prayer is a form of work and is an appointed means for obtaining the highest of all blessings. Peter asked. So what, are, what can you and I ask for that we haven't asked for in the past, right? I love that. All right, takeaway number five. God wants us to expect and prepare to accomplish the impossible. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a massive fan of our current prophet, President Nelson. He, I just, I love any chance I get to listen to him, study his teachings. And he, he said, I'm, I'm pretty much quoting him. God expects us to prepare and, or expect and prepare to accomplish the impossible. He said that in a worldwide uh, devotional for young adults, I believe January 2016, if I remember right, maybe 2015, I think it's 2016, <laughs> that we can do things we never realized we could do. Peter had never seen anyone walk on water, but when he saw Christ do it, he was probably like, well, maybe he'll give me the power to do it too, so let's ask, which is super cool. Growth happens as we reach out of the comfort zone. The comfort zone means it's comfortable inside there. That's not where we grow. Pushing out the comfort zone, that's how we grow. Our capacity grows, our faith grows, our, our obedience grows. It's a great place to grow. Uh, and I have a quote from Elder uh, Richard G. Scott, one of my favorite mentors about personal revelation. He said, to reach a goal you have never before attained, you must do things you have never before done. So Cr Peter has never walked on water before, but he had to actually do something he'd never done to see if he could do it, right? I love that. Okay, number six takeaway. Christ is an immediate savior. He's not the kind of savior that says, well, I don't really like you today, or I'm busy, or I just have a lot going on. I'm just kind of feeling lazy. He doesn't say that. He is an immediate savior. Now, that doesn't mean he immediately answers our questions and prayers right away. There's there's sometimes purpose for the pause. Sometimes we need to clean our lives up a little bit and become more worthy of receiving answers, or we need to learn something first so the answer has place in us. There's, so, there's often purpose for pauses in that way, but when we need rescue, he is so often so immediate with that love and that forgiveness and that, oh, like as soon as Alma, let's give you a couple, a couple other examples besides Peter. Alma the Younger, he's in the darkest abyss for several days remembering how his sins were just terrible. He'd been persecuting the saints and, and oh, he just felt horrible about it. Then he's like, wait a second, I remember something. I have a savior. And he, he called upon the Savior's name and immediately that darkness left and he was filled with hope and light, right? Same thing with uh, Joseph Smith when he was uh, in the sacred grove ready to say his prayer to ask God, well, which church should I join? He, the adversary just attacked him. And he, as soon as he was ready to just give up and give into this abyss, he thought he was dying. It was really, really tough on him. He's like, oh, I can call out to God. And he called out to the Lord Immediately, the darkness left and the light came. So 
I love that Christ is an immediate Christ. Isn't that just wonderful? And when we want to repent, I think that's when he is, is often the most immediate. I just love that. Um, let's see. And to that he immediately stretched out his arm and that we can let Christ lift us up to walking and moving forward again. It's okay that we stumble. It's really okay. Number seven, Christ is a Christ of the imperfect. He's a God of the imperfect. Not that he's imperfect, but he's our savior. He's the savior of the imperfect people. You and me. Isn't that nice to know? <laughs> it was so reassuring. Um, so as soon as Peter started sinking and said, Lord, save me, uh, or excuse me, I, I read the wrong, the wrong line, that Christ reaches out to us even when our faith is not enough, even when we get distracted by the ways, by doubts, by fear, by whatever, right? Even when we're not enough. You know what? It's part of the plan. It's part of the plan that we're not enough. It really is, which is kind of awesome because none of us is enough on our own. We need Christ and he is totally here for us in our imperfection. Number eight, don't label someone based on a weak moment. Don't do it. Would you, how would you like someone to watch a movie of your entire life Look at a weak moment and say, I'm going to label her or him on that. Ah, like doubting Thomas or Peter who denied the Christ or Peter who sank. No, I want to label Peter as he was the only one who had the guts to get out of the boat and walk on water. I just love that. And I, I told somebody today, I can't wait to get to the other side of the veil and ask Peter, tell me every detail. I want to hear this story from you. I want to hear all of it. And show me the movie if we can see that. I want to see it all and feel it and just be there with you. That would be so cool. Um, I love it. So to to same with ourselves. Don't don't judge ourselves based on our weaknesses. We are doing better than we often think. We are Satan gets to us. Satan gets to people who are trying and working to be good with focusing, helping us focus on our weaknesses and our our you know, imperfections and that we didn't quite make it and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's okay. It's part of the plan, but don't beat yourself up for it. See the good you do. See the good others do. See the good you are and the good others are. Number nine, quick obedience can invite miracles. Ooh, yeah. Quick obedient can, obedience can invite miracles. Peter took immediate action and that led to miracles. So don't wait until you know all the details of how to do something to just start walking, right? You can just start one step in front of the other, in front of the other. I love this saying that God can steer a, a moving car better than a parked car. Have you ever tried to steer a parked car? It's hard. <laughs> it's so much easier to steer a car once it's moving. And if you know something is right, just get moving on the path. Elder Holland gave a fantastic talk about that. That, that if something was right when you prayed about it, it's still right for the most part. I, I've had a couple experiences where, you know, he puts me on a path and then he says, okay, now turn this way, now this way. <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if you are making a decision to marry someone and you're like, yes, it feels right. Don't be surprised when doubts come later. That's just how our minds work. They want our, our subconscious programming wants to keep us safe and protect us from possible hurt. And also the adversary really wants to get in the way of anything good. So get walking on the path. And a good example of that is Nephi. When he's going back to get the brass plates, this is try number three after two supposed failures. I've, I've grown to see those, those two times as actually really awesome preparation for this epic success of try number three. But when he goes back in, he's like, I actually don't know how I'm going to get these splash plates. I really have no idea, but I'm going to start walking and trust the spirit will guide me. <laughs> and that's what, that's basically how Peter did this. He's like, he, he didn't stop and say, wait, I have to figure out exactly what my feet will do. Are they going to feel something hard under them when I walk on the water? I, I better not start because I don't exactly know. No. Do you know how many people, as a faith-based mentor, I see so many people stop their progress from living their divine life missions, moving forward in their goals because they don't know all the details. Just start moving. You can always adjust once you start moving. And God can always correct you. It's hard to steer a parked car. Okay. Number 10. Peter first confirmed it was God's will 
then he got out of the boat. Now, that might sound a little contradictory to what I just said, but that, that's one of the ways I am different than many of the mentors and coaches um, out in the industry is I really, you know me, if you know, if you follow me for very long, you know I love heaven journaling and I love personal mm -hmm. revelation. It's my favorite thing ever. And when, um, so as a mentor and when I do group mentoring or individual mentoring, I really encourage people, if you're going to set like a 30 day goal, check in with the spirit and see if it's in line with your path. If, cause we want you to, our, my purpose is to help people move forward in their divine life missions, whatever that is for this stage. So, you know, there's purpose in setting a goal to learn the goal template that, that I teach to learn that template and know how to push through their obstacles that pop up and, and, um, know how to empower their thinking and those kinds of things. But if we're going to be setting a goal and spending time on it, why not check in and just say, is this a good thing, God? And then, and then you can go for it knowing that when you receive God's will, you receive his power to do it. That's one of my favorite points about personal revelation is receiving God's will fills you with power to do it. Even if you don't know the next step, you just can start moving with faith. And that teeter-totter that I talked about earlier, it builds your faith to know it's God's will. You're like, well, God told me to, so I know he'll help me do this. Number 11, mistakes are fine. Mistakes are part of this life. Uh, even apostles aren't perfect. Isn't that comforting? <laughs> Mistakes are part of the plan. Even when we sink, we know Christ will save us. I, I, I just had some mis, misconceptions growing up about me and about God and about being worthy of his love. And eh, I'm grateful that I, I cleared some of that up. Very grateful. But we do not have to earn God's love, first of all. And being perfect has never been part of the plan on this planet. It is progress, not perfection. I actually had to go to a 12-step program to learn that. I just kind of missed that <laughs> somewhere. I thought I had to be perfect to earn God's love and uh, it's never felt good enough because we're not, we're never good enough without Christ. But with Christ, we've got his grace. We're yoked with him. We have his power. It's awesome, which is just such a blessing. In fact, I have a picture I'm going to show you really fast. My artist friend, Katie Garner, Okay, check this out. My artist friend, Katie Garner, I'll have to tag her now that I'm showing you this. My other friend named Jessica uh, commissioned Katie to paint this for her. Can you tell what this is? This is Christ in the yoke with you. You're yoked with Christ. When you've got him as like, you know how yoke, uh, a yoke holds like two oxen together, right? When you've got Christ next to you in the yoke, you've got all the power because he's infinite power. You can just have a little teeny bit of power and muscles and strength and it's okay because he has all. So you're totally good. <laughs> you can do whatever you're asked to do when you have Christ yoked with you. So the imperfection is absolutely part of the plan. Number 12, the one word answer that, that Christ gave Peter, come. In what ways is Christ asking you to come? Is he asking you to come and... Uh, do something really scary? Is he asking you to come and spend more time with him on a daily basis in prayer and scriptures and maybe heaven journaling? Is he inviting you to come and treat your children in more kind ways? What is he asking you to come and do? I just love that word. It's so, it's so filled with meaning. Come, come to me. I'm here. I will help you. You don't have to do any of this alone. I love that. Number 13, God knows how to do things we don't know how to do. Sometimes we start something with like excitement and enthusiasm and then we get going and we're like, what was I thinking? I have no idea how to do this. I can't do this as a matter of fact. Yikes. And, and you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a new calling or having a new baby or moving or, you know, just whatever, going back to college, whatever it may be. And we think, I can't do this, but here's the cool thing. Christ can, and he knows how. He can do anything. With Christ, nothing is impossible, right? And he knows how to do everything we need, which is so comforting. Uh, so again, we yoke with him, we yoke with him. When people say the saying, uh, let me know if you've heard this, let me know in the comments if you've heard this little saying, God will never give you a trial you can't handle. 
Well, I got an issue with that little saying because I disagree. I did. I believe he gives us trials we can't handle by ourselves deliberately. He either allows them or, or you know, gives them to us, whatever, whether it's tr trials or callings or promptings or life missions, whatever, that we can't do alone. I think it's absolutely on purpose because we need to yoke with Christ in order to do it. We must have his power to accomplish these missions, to accomplish these goals, to follow these promptings, to make it through some of the trials that we're, that we're faced with. We need him. It's part of the plan. It's totally okay that we can't do it on our own. Um, number 14, ask God to help magnify and multiply your efforts. I love that. It totally reminds me of a story right close by in the scriptures, which is multiplying the loaves and the fishes, right? Which is in several different places throughout the New Testament, the Gospels. And when, when they just had this little bit of food, probably barely enough to feed the apostles, maybe. I'm not sure if it was enough. And Christ is like, that's enough. I can deal with, I can, I can multiply that. You know, and he, he didn't say that, but that's what he's thinking, right? I can multiply that. And he multiplied it so big that it was enough to feed everyone plus leftovers. Now, what, what is our little effort, whether it be as a parent, in a, a church capacity, in a some sort of other service, or, or we're about trying to develop a talent or get an education or whatever, what do we bring to the table? And then we ask God to multiply it and magnify it. And he does. He totally does that for us if we ask and if we do our best to do his will. But we have to ask, right? That is a good thing to do is ask. Number 15, this is the very last one. This is from my Tammy, excuse me, my friend named Tammy from Canada. I love this question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this one as the final question or as the final statement, but it is a question. Am I a doer or a watcher? It's so interesting that some people focus on, well, Peter fell. He started to sink. <laughs> people, all the other apostles just watched. They just watched to see what would happen. One person got out of the boat to meet Jesus. He was the doer at the moment. I'm not saying nobody ever else ever did it any other time. We, I'm sure we don't have all the records, right? There's lots of, lots of blank space that, that we'll see the stories later. But Peter was a doer. So in the gospel, in your life, with your family, with your friends, are you just a watcher or are you a doer? Do you have the faith that Christ can magnify you and enable you? And when we yoke with him, that we have infinite power to do whatever he asks us to do? And do we check in with him to say, is this thy will? Okay, then now that I know it's thy will, I have, I can count on and I can call on thy power to help me do it. So there you go. There are my top 15 takeaways from the story of Peter walking on water. I, if you have any other takeaways or you have a favorite one that I listed, please type it in the comments below and feel free to, to go back a couple of days on my own Facebook feed if you want to read all those beautiful comments that my friends gave. You guys are awesome. I hope you have a fantastic Sabbath and I hope that you know you can do your own version of walking on water. God expects you to prepare and do the accompli and accomplish the impossible and he'll help you do it. Love you.